Hello and welcome back to White Lines Football. Lewis again here today with the first episode of the Gillingham podcast, exclusive to White Lines Football here on the channel. Sorry, I've got a sore throat. Be a little run in. Um, obviously, if you follow the channel, it's in my videos. You know, I'm a massive Gillingham fan. Uh, Jack follows Gillingham as well. Season ticket holder. Um, obviously, go to a lot of games, away games, home games, as many games as I can. And I wanted a place to talk about Gillingham as much as I possibly could because it is my one true passion. Rather than just having the vlogs, I thought, along with the White Lines Football Podcast, along with all the other videos on the channel, I would be bringing a podcast about Gillingham called the Gillingham Podcast to the channel. Going to have guests on, hopefully a few Gillingham fans. Jack's going to be joining me as well when we can. But yeah, here is a place to talk about Gillingham. It's going to be coming weekly, every Thursday. It's going to be reviewing the past games, previewing the games and having some more talking points. We're going to aim for five. Obviously, you can see the five to the right of your screen there. I'm going to be talking about Gillingham. That's literally it for about an hour. Hopefully, um, you can get some good chats underway about Gillingham. Just talking about them. So if you're interested in Gillingham, um, if you're a Gillingham fan, feel free to listen. Feel free to uh, put your opinions in, have a chat. Obviously, you can uh, look at us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, talk to us about Gillingham on there if you want. But yeah, obviously, um, I'm a massive Gillingham fan and this is this is what I want to do. So we're going to get into this episode, um, episode one. Obviously, the season has just started. That's why we're bringing the podcast to you starting today. You obviously saw the vlog on the channel. If you subscribe to the channel, if you don't, please do subscribe. Plenty of uh, football content. Um, Accrington was the first game of the season away last Saturday up in... Uh, 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 up north, really. Uh, first away journey I've done. A lot of travelling. Um, we left at half six. The coach was actually delayed because of us. We left at just after half six, and then we got there at about one o'clock after a couple of stops. Obviously, the game three till five ish. We left at just gone five, and we didn't get home till quarter to eleven. So it was a very very long journey. By the end, I was getting a bit restless, but it was worth it for the three points. Um, I think in terms of before the game, people were a little bit. Uh, weary of what we could do. I do a prediction league for Gillingham and I predicted a draw, you know, going away to a team that's just come up from League 2. Obviously, we did it the year before at Doncaster um, and we got a point, a 0-0 draw, and I thought that was a really good point. And this year, Accrington come up as champions and really blowing away League 2, to be honest. Uh, I think it's their first game at this level and uh, for a long time. And um, I would definitely take a point. I did predict beforehand one all. Um, I think a few more people said they would have been more than happy with a point, you know, going to the home of the League Two champions. They hadn't lost a home since December 2017, so they hadn't lost a home all year, League Two or not. It's still a really impressive, um, really impressive run. And you assumed that the ground was going to be bouncing; they were going to be well up for it, like Doncaster were the year before. But it, that wasn't to be. Um, I think the attendance halved from their final League Two game, which is poor. Apart from the drum, and when they were two 0 down, you couldn't really hear the Accrington fans. And they were really lovely. I spoke to a couple, but I think in terms of what I expected, they weren't great on the pitch or in the stands. They had the likes of uh, Billy Key, uh, Caden Jackson, who looks like he's going to be off. You know, a few big names there. And I think I expect them to be a lot better than they were. They didn't really threat. But we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, starting with Gillingham. So I think Lovell's tinkering a bit in pre-season. Steve Lovell, Gillingham manager, a little bit of context um, if you're not a Gillingham fan. We're tinkering a bit in pre-season between the 4-4-2 diamond and the 3-5-2. So obviously the 4-4-2 diamond, you have four centre midfielders sort of in a diamond way. Um, and then 3-5-2, you have wing backs. And Steve Lovell said that he doesn't like wingers. So those are the two formations it was really tinkering with. In his final pre-season game at Colchester, he started with the 3-5-2 before we went 2-0 down and then he went to the diamond. So I don't know if that made up Steve Lovell's decision. Um, normally, in the game before the season starts, you would be likely to go with the system and the team you want to start the season with. That's the way it normally goes. And he started with the three-five-two, but he quickly changed it, and then it sort of went out the window. And Mark Byrne got sent off, and it wasn't really ideal. And we got hammered. We found out when we got to the game that Alex Lacey was injured, and we have three senior centre backs, if you like. There are Max Aimer, Gabby Zakwani, and Alex Lacey, and obviously Finn O'Mara, and then you've got Jack Tucker and Ryan Huckle a bit lower down, just signing their pro deals. But Finn O'Mara hasn't really played much first-team action for Gillingham. So I don't know if it was the Lacey injury that allows Lovell to make his mind up. Um, assisting Moyes to play, you know, could he, would he have gone with Lacey in the back three? Or 
did he just not tr- and then did he not trust Omara? But he went with the diamond. Um, Callum Riley was also a late injury that we didn't know about when the team lights came out. He was a shock not to see starting. Um, we we're also missing Josh Reese, Elliot List, and Connor Wilkinson. But we knew that Wilkinson we found out the night before on Reese and List both missed the Colchester game. We found that out. Elliot List was a real, a real. Well, we thought it was going to be a real miss because um, obviously he had fine preseason form. And after that goal at um, Bristol Rovers, he got one at Plymouth. And then it looks like he's going to kick on. Hopefully he does when he comes back into the team. So the team was a little bit different to what we expected. I think m- myself, a lot, along with a lot of fans, were praying it wasn't a 3-5-2. And I was standing in the clubhouse with my dad, with Lee, um, a friend of mine. And the team came out and it wasn't what we expected. It was holy in goal. And then back four, which picks itself at the minute completely, O'Neill, Zakawani, Aymar and Garmston. If it was back three, then Lacey would have been in there, O'Neill and Garmston would have been the wing-backs. Uh, and then a midfielder would have dropped out. Uh, when the midfield came out, it was um, Bingham, Parrott, Regan, Charles Cook and Mark Burns. So obviously it was a sh- shock not to see Callum Riley in there. The way it did set out was Dean Parrott played at the bottom of the diamond and then Mark Byrne and Billy Bingham played either side with Regan Charles Cook in behind the strikers and then it was Josh Park and Brandon Hallin up front. Um, in pre-season, Parrott and Charles Cook had played together. It looked like Parrott was going to play at the tip of the diamond but Regan Charles Cook got the nod there. We obviously didn't see that until the teams came out. Um, but a lot of people you know, were questioning Parrott at the top and Regan Charles Cook was the man to drive the, with the ball forward. Um, Dean Parrott was sort of that... Um, sort of that anchor in a way because he wasn't your normal defensive midfielder which I do like he was more the um, guy to get on the ball and he did get stuck in as well but he had a lot of support from Byrne and Bingham but again we'll get to that in a minute so even though Dean Parrott played at the bottom of the diamond and Charles Cook played at the top Byrne on the right Bingham on the left rotation was key you know we saw Parrott going forward at times and Byrne dropping in or Bingham dropping in uh, the other the others going forward and they all covering each other which Lovell spoke about a lot and that really was key to the game and how it went. So in terms of the actual game itself, I think it started a bit even. I think Accrington probably had the best of the first five, ten minutes um, without really threatening too much, apart from Max Aimer having a header off the line. Um, one of Accrington's only two shots on target. Um, up the other end, Mark Byrne had a good volley, uh, which you obviously hear me talk about all this in the vlog, but again, I'll mention it now. Mark Byrne had a good volley that was well saved by the goalkeeper. But after the first 10 minutes or so, Gillingham were really on top. They looked like a score going forward every time. I think a few players had chances. Josh Parker had a really good chance and Mark Byrne pulled it back. But he leant back and absolutely booted it out of the stadium. And um, he had another good chance as well. The ball went across goal and he missed it. Yeah, Agriton weren't great. Um, they had two shots on target in the whole game. Holy didn't make a save. I think the other one was blocked by Luke O'Neill. Um, a bit further off than the line. And to be honest, it should have been more than two. The first goal came when uh, Billy, well, Bradley Garmson lost the ball and Billy Bingham won it back, actually, and he drove forward. He played against Regan Charles-Cook, who drilled it across. It was questionable goalkeeping. Brandon Hanna slid in. He got his goal. You know, good scenes in the away end. I was a bit halted because I couldn't tell. I wanted to look at the linesman and see if the flag went up. It didn't. The second goal came when Luke O'Neill put an absolute peach of a cross, what we've been accustomed to now, onto Josh Parker's head, who made no mistake this time. Um, and it went into the to the back of the net for 2-0. Um, I think it should have been more. You know, there was a few chances for Gillingham. Uh, second half, um, it sort of sat back a little bit, as you'd expect. But we still created chances. He's had a header over the bar. Dean Parrott had a good chance. Well, Regan Charles Cook had a good chance. Um, but I, it wasn't to come. But that's fine. You know, I think our squad's got the ability now to see games out. Um, you look at last year at Charlton, Northampton other games as well, um, where we've gone up early and we've seen the game out professionally in a professional way, which we'd never have done under Pennock, um, previous manage- previous management. But Billy Key, Caden Jackson, they were missing. I think Jackson obviously handed in a transfer request before the game. Um, he looks like he's possibly going to be on his way to Ipswich or Peterborough, I believe, if put in bids. Um, they were both they were both missing. I think Max Aim and Gabby Zaka Zaka only did a really good job there. Jackson looked la- relaxed interest. He didn't chase much when he lost the ball. And I thought it was quite poor. But um yeah, like I said, two shots on target. One was off the line by Aimer and the other one was blocked by Luke O'Neill up the other end. Parker's best probably had the two best chances that he missed. Then I slated him for it and then he went and scored a goal, so that's fine. Um but he's scoring, that's the main thing. And I think, you know, especially shooting towards that away end, we look dangerous going forward on the counter. Um 
and that's nice because we did move the ball well and it's not something we've necessarily seen you know last season I think the midfield was definitely our weak point as well as up front but midfield if you compare it to now's midfield you know we've only seen one game of them in competitive football but last year's midfield was slow it was lacklustre um they got beaten easily but this year it looks like we've got a lot of depth which I'll talk about in a little bit um but you know it it's a strong midfield it was nice they moved the ball quickly they kept possession really well I think Dean Parrott at the bottom of the system he controlled the ball really well and he, had to, he could go forward when he wanted to and you know Byrne and Bingham could just tuck in and it was so nice and Billy Bingham just turned into Lionel Messi basically but we'll go on to the player analysis now um, Ho Thomas Holy um, like I said didn't have a save to make it looked comfortable he only kicked one ball out which you know he normally kicks a lot more out but he got frustrated with himself pretty easily uh, he's also got a new goalkeeper coach this year um, he kicked one ball out um and apart from that, his catch and he dropped one on Luke O'Neill's head, which he caught straight away. But apart from that, absolutely spot on. It's a good start from him. He's got a clean sheet, which is one ticked off. Um, right about Luke O'Neill, you know, for me, bloke's the best right back in the league. Um, he's strong defensively. When he came in, he was a bit questionable defensively. At times he got beaten and sometimes he might overcommit. But he's strong defensively. He knows when to kick the ball long. He knows when to see it out. He knows when to kick the ball into the channels. Maybe sometimes does it a little bit too much for my liking, but he does it well. He gets the ball out. That's the main thing. He's a defender, you know. And from set pieces, he's an absolute danger, whether it's a, a shooting free kick, whether it's a crossing free kick, a corner, where he just gets the ball to whip it in. He's unreal, and he can chip in with a goal as well. And he obviously got the assist for Parker's goal. That's one off the mark. A very, very good player. Gabby Zakwani and Max Amer, you know, they're two players we've come accustomed to playing solidly. Um... Zakawani said hello to me after the game, actually. Obviously, recognised me from when we did our interview. He put his body on the line all the time. He's also our new captain. First clean sheet of the season for our new captain, which is lovely stuff. Max Amon next to him as well. Who looks a little bit lazy to me in the warm-up, but when it came to the game, he just makes it look so simple. Does Max Amon? He makes it look so simple, like dealing with it and playing out from the back. I think they're a really good partnership. I'm a bit torn that Gabby Zakawani plays on the left of the defence or the left of the two, but it's not the end of the world. Um... I think I'll probably like Max Amos to do it because he played there with John Egan, Dead Josh Larger, and it's a bit more cover, but that's fine. You know, Zakawani, I think he 90% of the time he's just kicking the crap out of the ball. So I think it doesn't matter if it's his left foot or right foot. Max Amos, if you want, maybe if he wants to play at the back a little bit more, he wants his more natural right foot there. Um, maybe that's why. But it's not the end of the world. And Bradley Garmson as well. Hopefully we can rely on him this season. He... Um, He's back to full fitness, you'd assume, and he's getting forward well. You know, he's really comfortable on the ball. Sometimes defensively, he got caught out at one point when there's a ball into the back post. Um, but it's not a problem, you know. He's not um, He's not noticeably questionable defensively. But going forward is where he's really at the real asset um, as well. And his crossing's improved as well. And he put a good, good performance. So, like I said, Dean Parrott at the bottom of the diamond. Um... He was key, getting on the ball, he got stuck in as well, which was really good, he did the dirty work. And then Mark Byrne, obviously, chipped, nearly chipped him with a goal, nearly got sent off, actually, went over the ball, uh, called for a red card, it could have been a red card, but it was only yellow at the end of the day. And then Billy Bingham as well, who we've missed so much, I cannot stress it. You know, whether he's playing centre midfield, centre back, or defensive midfield, he's a key asset, and he was brilliant. Um, going forward, actually, his dribbling was really good. And then obviously, he covered Parrott when needed, and he tracked back, and that's exactly what you want from your centre midfielder. And it was brilliant because, you know, he probably wouldn't have started had Riley been fit. Um, you think he'd probably be the man that Riley would come in for um, in that actual system that it did pay out. But um, he did, and I think he's going to take some moving because he was really impressive. Uh, Regan Charles Cook, for me, was my man of the match. He drove forward really well. He looked so creative, which we didn't really see in pre-season, you know. Charlton fans slated him they, that he was they were his previous club. Um but we didn't really see it in pre-season because he played it a bit deeper. But playing playing forward with a bit more license and freedom, he was excellent. You know, he was trying to pick out key passes. He was driving forward every given opportunity. He nearly had a goal himself late on. It was blocked. Um, but yeah, I was really impressed with him. I'm excited to see more of him because I didn't have him down as a starter, to be honest. When he first came in, I was didn't even have him in my squad. You know, I'd, I said at the time I would rather have seen Darren Aldake than him. And I really do hold my hands up for that because... He really impressed me. And I said in pre-season he looked good. But this game was a step up and he was so impressive, you know. He looks just creatively lucky like to score or lay an assist at any point. And he obviously got the first assist as well. It was really good. Um, we'll talk about Josh Parker. Uh, he's a very frustrating player. Um, when he came in, people praised his work ethic. He got a new two-year deal. 
I don't know if that led to him being a bit more lazy. Um, he is a lazy player. I don't think he chases stuff down too much. I think he complains a little bit. And he missed two really good chances. You know, he missed that one that Burn pulled back and he missed the, the ball that came across goal as well. But he got the goal and he got off the mark. One thing I will say to, about him is his hold-up play was really good. You know, he's not a big man. But he wins a lot in the air, and when he's holding the ball up, it's really, really impressive. The way he plays with the defenders, I was impressed by it. He's going to take some moving because he does get goals. He's not my sort of player, but he does get goals, and that's okay. You know, at this level, you want goals, and they win games at the end of the day. Um, Brandon Hanlon as well, linked up really well with his former Charlton teammate, Regan Charles-Cook. Um, he got goals in pre-season. I think he was... It was questionable because it looked like we were playing a lot of balls over the top to him um, for him to run onto. But in this game, you know, he, he ran with the ball at his feet and it was very much ball to feet. You don't want him to be too much of a ball to feet person trying to hold it up and fight with defenders because that's not the sort of player he is. But he's agile, he's quick and he obviously got a goal as well. And hopefully, um, hopefully he will get a few goals this season. In my opinion, the best players were Zachary Bingham, Parrott and Regan Charles-Cook. My man of the match was Regan Charles-Cook. But overall, it was really good, um, a really good performance. I think anyone had a bad game. If I had to rate them all out of 10, then it would be at least 7, 8. Um, one thing that surprised me is there's only one change. Steve Lovell only made the one change. He changed Brandon Hanlon for Tommy's on about 65 minutes. Um, obviously, you want Eves to get some minutes in legs. And the bench wasn't the strongest. It was Hadler, Fuller, Simpson, um, Stevenson, Nasseri, Nash and Eves. I think he probably could have bought on... Um, Nasseri for Charles Cook later on. He probably could have bought a National Park or something like that. It'd have been nice to just get some more minutes in legs. It probably sends a message to his bench. He doesn't necessarily trust him. He spoke about it a few times. He actually, we spoke about it in the Q&A about his bench being a little bit poor. But uh, it's probably not the best message to send out. But he wanted to win the game. That's important. And I'm sure those players will get chances later on. Um, I don't think anyone had a bad game. Accrington were poor. We look like scoring. It is only Accrington. It sounds bad. But, you know, they were poor. I think if they carry on like that, they will struggle next year um i think a lot of teams will beat them and they will be struggling but as the old cliche goes you can only beat what's in front of you and that's what we did i'm sure we'll be tested at priestfield when the pitch is different because Aquiton's pitch was really nice at the crown ground um i'm sure we'll be tested when teams keep the ball better than us but we did keep the ball well maybe we're going to start to dictate games especially with that strong midfield now um and the ability to change systems if needed as well which is handy but it was impressive. I think he's probably got to go with the same team for a, a while, despite players coming back. We'll talk about that in a little bit in the previews for the next week's games. But, yeah, it was impressive. We've got three points on the board. We're second in the league. If the season finished now, we're going up automatically. So, let's do that. But, like I say, Gillingham 2. Well, Accrington 0, Gillingham 2. Very good day out. A lot of travelling. Um, check out the vlog. That's on the channel. But it was good. Um Three points on the board and a solid, solid start to the season. So we will move on now a little bit to the midfield in focus. Um, I spoke a little bit about it in the Accrington review, but we're going to look at it a little bit more. Obviously, I said about how the midfield's been completely changed um, with all the players going out. So Lovell said that Jake Hesenthaler, Lee Martin and Scott Wagstaff all released because they didn't provide enough goals. And that's, that's fair enough. Um, a lot have come in and we have a lot of personnel in there now, especially doesn't look like we're gonna be playing wingers. Um We have seven main midfielders I think that are gonna be playing a bit of football this year. They are Regan Charles Cook, Josh Rees, Dean Parrott, Mark Byrne, Callum Riley, Navin Nasseri and Billy Bingham. And then we have the first slash second year pros um ranked lower down. So Bradley Stevenson, Henry Woods, Ben Chapman and Darren Oldacre. They'll probably all go out on loan for a little bit this year. The midfield's good, you know, it's good times for the midfield. I think last year I've been I've made my opinions on Mark Byrne very vocal. I do really rate Mark Byrne as a footballer and when I see his name on the team sheet in the right position I'm really happy, you know. Aquiton Saturday he played right of the diamond and it was so good. You know, he's a key player. I just don't like seeing him at the bottom of the diamond because like I said rotation's key. I know everyone's gonna be rotating but at the end of the day you do have a shape and Mark Byrne his shape position, if you like was at the bottom of the diamond, and I think he got caught out quite a lot there last year. But I'm really happy with him. Um, I think you assumed going into the season Billy Bingham's going to be playing there, or um, or maybe even Mark Byrne, you know, if, if Josh Rees was going to come in, or Regan Charles Cook. You assume that. I think you assumed Billy Bingham was going to play CDM, but he didn't. You know, Dean Parrott played there. I think 
if you looked at that four before the game, you'd assume that Billy Bingham would play bottom, Mark Bowen would play right, Dean Parrott um, would play at the top, and Charles Cook would play left, or him and Burn swap, whatever. Um, it was completely different. You know, Mark Bowen still played right, but Dean Parrott was at the bottom, Riga Charles Cook at the top, Billy Bingham at the left. And I think that rotation is really good. I think Navin Nasseri, if he came in, he probably would play top. He's very probably very specialised for that. But Callum Riley, I think he could play bottom, he could play right, he could play left, he could probably play top. Um, who was who else missed out? Josh Reese. He's known for playing behind the strikers at Bromley. Also, he scored twenty goals last season, but he played a little bit deeper in preseason. So everyone's helping each other out. And I've all spoke a lot about having the graft in midfield. You know, you can be as all flary and creative as you want, but if you lose the ball, you have to go and fight for it back. And he said that's why Darren Oldig is not near his team at the minute. And if those seven players are uh, uh, sort of rare, rare in to do that, then that's good. Billy Bingham put in a really good performance. Probably the best I've seen him in a dual shirt. And I think Callum Riley, even if he's fit for Saturday, he's going to have a real job getting back in. Um, he's going to have to fight. Obviously, he's our vice captain. He's just come in and he will be on the bench, probably replacing Bradley Stevenson. And if Josh Reese is fit, he'll probably replace Navin Aseri as well. But the best four, those like those four, they were really good. And it makes a real problem deciding on the, the, um, the best four because you can't at the minute. I think Mark Burn gets in the side, whatever. And off Saturday's performance, Regan Charles Cook does as well. And Dean Parrott probably does as well. So then it's Bingham O'Reilly. You know, there's, there's, we've got a really good midfield there. It's a really good League One midfield. They're going to keep the ball. They're going to defend. And I'm really happy with it, actually. Especially if you're not going to have wingers. You've got players willing to track back. Players that can play out wide there. You know, Billy Bingham was bombing down the left wing on Saturday. It's hard to um, choose the best four. So, touching a little bit on rotation. Obviously... It's very fluid, but you do have a shape as a midfield. Last year, Mark Byrne was playing at the bottom, Lee Martin was playing at the top, you know, Jake Hezen, Tyler, etc., etc., Callum Riley when he came in. Uh, the general shape is obviously a diamond, but it can switch into a flat 4 4 2 easily. It was fluid. The general shape was Dean Parrott at the bottom, and then Billy Bingham and Mark Byrne, and then Charles Cook at the top, like I've touched on many a time. Parrott had really good support from Bingham and Byrne, I think that's key. You know, Bingham, you'd associate him as a natural defensive midfielder, and then Mark Byrne. Um, played there a lot last year. You know, he rolls his sleeves up and gets back. Lovell praise him for that. Lovell hates wingers. He said that he doesn't see the point in wingers. You know, so if we're playing a three-five-two or a four-one-two-one-two, one, two, we're not going to have wingers. I mean, sometimes he played it last year with four-two-three-one, but they're more inside forwards to extent. Especially Josh Parker. Um, but yeah, the midfield will be packed. Whatever happens, if he's not going to play with wingers, whether it's a three-five-two, you've got the three men in there, which should. Well, before it was. Parrott, Riley and Burton, which is a good three. Um, but then you've obviously got to look at where Charles Cook fits in, in that system after his game. I think he's going to stick with Diamond at the minute. If you've got four centre midfielders, that's really good because it's so fluid and they can play anywhere and it's so good um, in terms of keeping the ball. It's going to be packed. You know, teams will come and want to keep the ball against us, the top teams, but we're going to pack them on field and try and keep it ourselves. And that's really good. And the rotation's key. They're all backing up each other. You know, I remember at one point... Uh, first half, Dean Parrott ran all the way up the pitch to close down their defender that's booting the ball long. And who's there to mop it up? Billy Bingham, Mark Byrne. You know, Regan Charles Cook gets back if necessary. And it's good, and that's what they need to do, and that's what Lover wants. And moving on a little bit to Darren Oldacre, in a bit of focus, that's what he needs to do, because Lovell criticised him. Lovell said that Darren Oldacre is nowhere near his team at the minute because he doesn't do what Mark Byrne does or Callum Riley does. If he loses the ball, he doesn't roll his sleeves up and get it back. The amount of times that's been said by previous management... I don't know why he hasn't done it yet, uh, DJ. I don't know why he hasn't sort of put it upon himself to do that. Um, I don't know if he has an attitude problem. You know, he's a, he's a shadow of where he was in the team under Edinburgh when he was not even a pro yet and when he was in the 18 on a match day. Um, Lovell ripped into him. I think in terms of how close Olekar is to the side, first of all, Bradley Stevenson was on the bench on Saturday over him. You know, the two midfielders, Bradley Stevenson and Navin Nasseri, probably play the same position anyway. Darren Oldacre's a bit deeper, but that's the way it was. Um, ben Chapman played over him in a friendly match on Tuesday against Oxford. I know uh, the system was a bit... In midfield, there was Chapman, Stevenson and Nasseri, so if you put Oldacre in as well, Chapman's more adapted to... Um, to play in the position to protect the defenders rather than Darren Oldeck. So that could have been a part of it. But if, on the surface, Darren Oldeck can't get in a reserve side, and that, that does leave you a bit of a worry. I think he does need to go on loan, but not at a high of town where he's going to bang him in for fun. He needs to go to a National League side, or he needs 
he's not going to get into a League 2 side, but he could go to a National League side. I think that's where he needs to go, really. You know, he could help out the Kent clubs in Maidstone, Ebbsfleet. Lovell said that he prefers his players not to go there because they're going to get 20 minutes a week. But I think Lovell just... Old Day needs to play at a decent level, and that is a decent level. There's no point in sending him to a team where he's going to you know, score 20, 20 a season and just have fun and not really learn because that's not what he needs at this stage of his career. He's just signed a new deal. And at this rate, he is absolutely not going to get a new one next year. I can't say I've noticed anything with his attitude. He was left out of school quite a lot by Pennock because Charlie Edinburgh, who was Justin Edinburgh, the previous manager's son, was his agent, and he switched he switched agent eventually. Um, but yeah, he's not been involved. He's a mile off. And Lovell said that he needs to roll his sleeves up and get stuck in. And if he's not done that, why hasn't he done that? You know, um, a professional footballer, He's obviously been shouted at it in training. I don't know why he's not going to go and do it on a match. Um, obviously, he's not showing that in training. I can only see he's got an attitude problem. But I'm not sure how much of him we will see this year. So I am recording this podcast on the Wednesday, but it's obviously up on the Thursday. And, well, as far as like transfer window goes, it closes today. Um, obviously, the actual signs have got to be done today. Players can go out on loan or come in on loan until... The end of August, so that's not too much for worry, especially the squad we've got at the minute. Um, in terms of transfer talk, there's a bit of confusion if Steve Lover wants someone because you know it does look like we're pretty set in terms of first team personnel at least. But he did say that in the Q and A he might dip into the market to get one or two more, and then he said he doesn't like wingers, so he's not looking to bring in a winger. And then the Gillingham Twitter account has reported that he wants to bring a left sided player, so one can only assume that's a left back, Aaron Simpson. You know traditionally left back was obviously on the bench on Saturday against uh, Accrington so maybe that means a left back um, I think in my opinion we need a centre back you know we can't rely on Alex Lacey you know there wasn't a centre back on the bench Saturday I was quite surprised by that considering Barry Fuller was there as a full back he was always going to be there and then I thought Finn O'Mara might be there because Fuller can cover both sides and then Finn O'Mara may be the backup centre-back. But if a centre-back was to go off injured, I don't know what would have happened. Barry Fuller probably would have come on and played centre-back or Loco Neal could play centre-back. But I think if Alex Lacey, I know he's only got a knock at the minute, but he missed a lot of last year. He's very injury-prone. I think we need to go and get a centre-back on loan or permanent. Probably not permanent. On loan, a nice young centre-back um, from the Premier League or an experienced centre-back that a club no longer wants will go down just fine. Um... Someone that could do a job, you know, like a Ben Nugent. You know, it's a shame he's gone at this point because he'd have been excellent cover. He obviously wants to play first team football. He's now at Stevenage, that's fair enough. He started their game um, against Tramere on Saturday in a 2 draw. So it's a shame that he's gone, but it's fair enough. Um, Finn and Mara was obviously prepared to step up. But I think with Alex Lacey's injury, you can't really go through a season with two... two, two Alex Lacey's injury record, sorry. With two first team centre-backs and then... Um, like sort of Finn O'Mara as the third choice with all due respect to Finn um, and Alex as well um, I'd like a centre back I'd also like a winger but that's not going to happen um, I think it'd be nice to have a backup plan in terms of wingers at the minute I think we've got um, Elliot List and Josh Parker who could be could be considered natural wingers obviously Lovell said Elliot List's best position is up front obviously Parker gets goals so he's going to play up front even though I prefer him out on the left or the right preferably the left um, I'm not going to play with wingers, but it would be nice to have someone, if it goes wrong, you know, maybe a guy on loan from the championship, something like that. Um, like I said, it doesn't look like we're going to get anyone permanently at the minute. Um, but it's probably going to be loans. Um, you know, people calling for a striker, maybe a certain Cody McDonald. Um, Lovell said that he doesn't want to sign Cody McDonald, who's just left Wimbledon, because he believes he doesn't fit his system because he's not quick enough anymore. So, a few shots fired there, but it's completely fair enough. I'm not going to lose sleep over that. Not happening. But I think, obviously, we're stacked in centre midfield. Um, I think we're fine at full-back as well. We're fine in goal. Um, up front, I think we're fine. You know, hallen has got a goal. Lister's to come back. Wilkerson's to come back. Eves is to come back. Parker's got a goal. We've still got Nash in the in the waitings. I think we're fine up top. Um would be nice to have a winger, but I think that's going to happen. And then I think a centre-back as well. So if I could have one more position, it would be a centre-back, which is a shame because Alex Lacey's injury record looks like it could hinder him again this year. In terms of outs, I don't think there will be anything permanently. Uh, the main player, Thomas Holy, has been linked. Um, 
He's been linked to a range of clubs such as Arsenal, West Ham, Crystal Palace, all the London clubs. Even Middlesbrough popped up, I think. Um, I think someone mentioned Thomas Holy going to either Arsenal or West Ham and Holy asked if it was a joke. So, obviously, he's not aware of it. I think at Arsenal, that would be a funny one because he would be like sixth-choice goalkeeper. Maybe he would move up to third-choice, something like that, but he's not going to go and play football there. And he's not at a young age. He's, what, 26? Um Due respect to him, he's not at the youngest age. I think West Ham, um, they've obviously just signed Fabianski. They've got Adrian there. You know, how much football do you get there? Crystal Palace does sort of make sense. You know, Hennessy. Um, Hennessy's questionable goalkeeper. He's not really rated um, by a lot of people, including myself. And I've likes Julius Broni, who's about 84 years old. Um, so maybe that would make sense for Holy. You know, he could go and sit on the bench probably if he went there Middlesbrough as well you know they've got Darren Randolph um, and they've got that guy I can't pronounce his name I can't pronounce his name but he's getting on a bit and he's obviously the third choice goalkeeper when they're in the Premier League um, but yeah um, I don't think Holy will go he's obviously going into the last year of his deal I think price wise people have been saying 3 million which is absolutely ridiculous you know, I even I even saw someone say that, um, oh, it's a Premier League club that won't wait round. Like, sorry, um, they're not they're not just going to chuck money out to save time. It's, st- it's still money if you get what I mean. But going into deadline day, uh, well, I suppose we'll probably know by the time this has gone up if anything's happened. But um, I can't see it happening. We'd have to replace him quickly. Um, obviously, Cafaro actually, Louis Cafaro, the third choice goalkeeper, just got a loan today to Home Bay at the time of recording it on Wednesday. Um, so that's good for him. I think a lot of the other youth players will go out on loan as well. So if a goalkeeper is going to get injured, um, Cathro would obviously have to be recalled. I think Lovell's obviously quite confident. Holy won't um, go tomorrow because Cathro would have to be called, recalled straight away. But I think Tom Hadler's more than capable of stepping up as number one. But um, obviously we'd have to get someone else in. You've got the loan window, but Cathro would have to come back straight away. So obviously I think he's pretty confident keeping Holy. In January, it could be a different story. The only other player that's really been linked to the move is Tom Eves, has been linked with Bristol Rovers, I think. Um, a few murmurs of him linking with Peterborough as well, they're after a target man. But nothing too strong there, I don't think he's going to go. Obviously, he's going to last year's deal as well. I don't know what sort of price he'd be looking at for him, probably about 500k after getting 17 league goals last season. 18 in all competitions, obviously got a goal against Leighton Orient in the FA Cup, but... I don't think either of them will go. I think we're probably set in terms of first team players. I don't think we're going to sell anyone. In terms of loans, obviously, there's a long time to go in the loan window. Cafferell's gone already. I think we're probably going to see all the first year pros go out. You know, Ryan Huckle, Jack Tucker, Henry Woods. Um, some second year pros as well. Darren Oldacre, like I say, should go out on loan. Um, I also think, um, who am I going with? Ben Chapman will probably go out on loan considering we're stacked in midfield. Aaron Simpson might be needed around if we don't get a left back in. Um, Bradley Stevenson as well could go out on loan but again the injury situation you can't send all the midfielders out on loan uh, or you'd have to recall one if it worst came to worst of Riley and Reese's injuries um, and then you've also got Finn O'Mara who can't go on that on loan at the minute especially with the lack of cover we have there and Nolan Bow as well probably needs to go on loan one other name is Liam Nash you know it's a shame that he didn't get any minutes at the weekend he had a good pre-season he tries really hard but he's just not got his chance as he under pinnacle level um but he's a good player. I believe he's got a lot of potential. He'll miss a few chances, but he'll then go and try his best to redeem that. With Wilkerson and he's coming back, I can't see him getting too much game time. Maybe he should go out on loan to, like, an, like again, a Maystone or an Ibsfleet um, and then come back and try and get in the team as it goes into last year of his contract because he knows where the net is at the end of the day. I think he's the regen Cody McDonald, so to speak. He's a good player and it's a shame if he went, but um, it doesn't look like he's going to get too much game time, so he'll probably go out on loan as well. Um... Apart from that, I think it's going to be pretty quiet last few weeks. One thing I did want to touch on a little bit today was the contract situation. I was playing around a little bit of the contracts earlier, looking at who's out of contract where. Um, and we have 32 currently contracted pros, if you don't count Danny, D- Danny Devine. He's got a third-year scholarship because he had an injury last year. He's got another injury now, but um, he's got a chance to prove himself before he decides, he decides whether or not he gets a pro deal. Um 21 of those 32 contracted players are out of contract at the end of next season. So we're going to go through the squad now. And off the top of my head, I'm going to say if they're out of contract or not. So Thomas Holy is out of contract. He's got a year left. Luke O'Neill's got a year left. Bradley Garmson, he signed a new two-year deal. 
Alex Lacey's got a year left. Max Aymer and Gabby Zakwani both signed two-year deals. Brandon Hanlon signed a t- two-year deal. Dean Parrott has as well. Tom Eves in his last year. Connor Wilkerson is in his last year. Regan Charles Cook's got a two-year deal. Barry Fuller's got a one-year deal. Obviously, he's a little bit older. Callum Riley's got a two-year deal. Josh Parker's going into his last year. Uh, Elliot List has signed a new two-year deal. Billy Bingham's going into his last year. Navin Nasseri signed a new one-year deal as well. Uh, 18. Liam Nash isn't going into his last year. Aaron Simpson got a one-year deal. So Darren Oldacre, Finn O'Mara, Ben Chapman, Nolan Bowe. They all got one-year deals. But uh, Josh Reese has got um, two years. Obviously, he's just come in. 25 is Bradley Stevenson, who has got a one-year deal. And then Jack Tucker, Ryan Huckle, Henry Woods have all got... Um, all got one year one year deals. Lyric Labby, number twenty nine, has got a six month deal, so he'll be out of contract before the end of the season. He could get that improved to the end, probably that'll probably be the way, but we'll see. Um number thirty is Tom Hadlow, who's got a one year deal as he's going to his last year. Uh Daniel Devine, number thirty one. But obviously we'll see what happens with him. And Louis Caffarel's got a year, and then Mark Byrne, who's also signed a two year deal. So a lot of players out of contract. A lot of them are youth players. Um so like nineteen up and mostly youth players. But it's still the squad, um, you know, it still resembles the squad. And you, if you lose your squad, you like, you could chuck Aaron Simpson in, I think he'd do a job. You could chuck Finn O'Mara in, I think he'd do a job. You know, Simpson and Stevenson are both on the bench Saturday, so obviously level trust them if needed. Um, you know, if Bradley Garmstor enough injured, I'm sure Aaron might have come on or maybe Fuller would have come on and gone left back, but you'd like to think that Simpson would come on. Um They've all been off the contracts for a reason. You can't afford to lose your squad. You know, they wouldn't affect the first team too much. Um, they're not all going to go, obviously, because I can't imagine players at that age are going to have too many offers from League One League One clubs. But it's important not to lose the squad and the base of it, because if they all went, you'd be left with what, 20 players and then um, probably even less, and then a few of them out of contract as well. In terms of the other lads out of contract, I think the likes of Tommy... Right, the main three players, Tom Eves, Luke O'Neill, Thomas Holy. At the end of next season, they are going to have higher offers, especially if they have consistent years. If Tom Eves goes and gets another 10 goals this year, if Thomas Holy impresses, if Luke O'Neill impresses again, they are going to have higher offers next year on more money. And with all due respect to us, why would you turn that down? Um, and we're going to lose them on a free. You know, you don't want to lose players that stature on a free. Holy, O'Neill and Eves combined, if we sold them right now, I reckon we could get a good one and a half million pounds for them, the three of them. And that's a lot of money for a club at this level. Um, I know we don't see it but obviously it goes into clubs somewhat um, and you can't afford to lose that um, after January or in January obviously they can sign pre-contract agreements with clubs it doesn't happen too often at this level but it can happen so I think we time time down or we'll risk losing them um, they all, those three have the potential to play higher um, and there's no point in signing a new contract after January because if they don't sign it you can't sell them on anyway because um, they'll be out of contract so in my opinion, those three, we need to either tie them down to a new deal this year or we need to um, move them on in January because you can't afford to lose that sort of money unless we're in a real fight. You know, if we're in the bottom three, bottom four, sorry, um, come uh, come Janu- uh, January, keep them because your League One status is more important than that money, I think. As much as it pains me to say it, we would need to move them on because they. Have, I can guarantee if we let the contracts run out, I can't guarantee it, but I think they would be stupid to not move on because they will have higher left, higher offers. I think Tom Eves could have offers from higher championship club, uh, League One clubs, like I say, Bristol Rovers and Peterborough are linked. I think Luke O'Neill and Thomas Holly could easily play in the championship. Um, and I think they probably will go on to do that at the end of the season, at least, um, unless we tie them down on deal. So we do need to do that, in my opinion. It's just something I was thinking about. And a lot of the squads, obviously... 11, well, 10, if you take out Lyra Club, you're actually under contract. So I think we do need to sort that out because that's not a healthy situation. Um, I think, obviously, you've got to replace them if we sold those three on in January. Depending on the seasons they have, you'd have to replace them. I think Fuller and Hadler could also do jobs, but they're not up to the same level as um, as Holy and O'Neill and then Tom Eves as well. It depends on the season he's going to have. But I think if they if they if we can't sign them down for a deal, we do need to move them on. That's reality of football because I think hoping that they sign a deal at the end of the season would be a massive risk and we will risk losing them for nothing. Like with Ben Nugent, obviously we lost him for nothing. It wasn't a big deal. Um, he wouldn't have gone on for too much money anyway had we sold him. Um, obviously, we offered him a contract. So we will now move on to the future fixtures. Obviously, it's currently Thursday. Wednesday for me, Thursday for you. 
Um, and the football season is underway. We had no midweek game this week. Obviously, we had Accrington. And then this Saturday, we kick off our home campaign against Burton Albion. On paper, when you get a relegated championship team, Burton Albion coming to Priestfield, um, you know, we remember them last time in League One, obviously, they went up. Um, you'd be worried. But I think if you look at Burton and the state of the club at the minute, um, it's not ideal. You know, I know we speak about how often pre-season means nothing, how, um, but obviously, we got a good hiding against Colchester. Burton had an awful pre-season, so they lost to Mikelova Sports, Aston Villa, Solihull Moors, Alfreton and Cardiff. And they lost quite heavily as well. They exceeded a few goals. I think they exceeded five to Alfreton. Um, it wasn't an ideal pre-season. They've suffered since they've come down. Um, on their opening game, they lost to Rochdale. Rochdale obviously survived on the last day last year. They lost 2-1 to Rochdale. Um, Rochdale, you'd imagine, will be down there. And I think a lot of people are tipping Burton to be down there as well. I think a lot of the Burton fans want Clough out. Um, obviously, Nigel Clough's there at the minute. He took him up, but now he's taken him down. Well, he took him up, kept him up, and now he's taken him down. Um, a lot of people are calling for his head at the minute. Uh, their goalkeeper, Stephen Bywater, who we know from Gillingham, his time at Gillingham, um, he's been telling fans to F off. He's been swearing at his own fans. Um, and a lot of people are tipping him for double relegation. You know, they don't seem to have a settled squad at the minute. The fans the pl- and the players and staff are all on the wrong side. And, you know, Burton are in a bit of state at the minute. And it is always a good time to play teams that have just come down early because they're settling into the league. They don't know what to predict as such. You know, you look at Blackburn last year and they came down, they lost the first three or something like that. And they went on to get promoted, obviously. But it's good to play them early. Um, I think we should win. I think we should win this game. I think, obviously, Burton struggled. They lost against Rochdale. They went 2-0 down in that one as well. And I think we should get a result. Um, that was at home. Priestfield will play a big role. Um, the atmosphere, we know it's awful at the minute at Priestfield. Um, we know that um, the pitch isn't great. But I think we need to play our football. You can have a plan A, a plan B. You can play certain ways in certain situations. We need to get Priestfield rocking. You know, hopefully the attendance will be up. You know, it's been down below or well, around 4K at some points last season. Um, even though I questioned 4K being there. But the 4K there at some points last season, I think this this first game we need at least five and a half grand this year um, for the first game. I think we need to get behind uh, behind Burton. Uh, sorry, not behind Burton, behind Gillingham against Burton. Um, I think if you look at the Plymouth game, we were right behind them and there was a really good party atmosphere. Obviously, we knew we were safe and we went and put five past them. So that does play a role. I think the players have spoke on many an occasion how important the atmosphere is at Priestfield. If the fans get behind them, the team plays well. They speak about the away support. The fans get behind them, the team plays well. I think that's important. Um, you know, Holy in front of the Rainer Mend as well. He loves the away. He loves the home fans. You know, he's smiling his face when we chant his name at the start of the game. is brilliant. Um, and after the game as well, when we win, um, when he screams and like all the um, all the fa- all the players are so happy. I think the fans do play a really big role. And we don't need to get on the back. You know, the dickhead next to me that goes, "I love you, Connor." Every two seconds, don't. Um, Lovell spoke at the Q&A about how unnecessary hate and stick and stuff isn't ideal for the players and it's not um, it's not great for them that's not what they want you know it does play on the mind he said they need to speak and deal with it but you know sometimes you can't and psychology you know I say it makes a big role of sport um, I think it's important and that's why you make your home your home ground a fortress isn't it you, you um, get behind them you make it uncomfortable for opposition supporters Uh opposition players as well I think as a supporter when you go to an away game the worst feeling is a stadium erupting when the home team scores so one that haunts me is when we went to Coventry a few years ago when we were top and they were second and we exited four in the first half and every time yes yes it's just echoing in your head the whole stadium erupting your team's just conceded it's crap um and obviously the fans don't want that the players aren't going to want that um a big problem is the pitch. It's not great. We know that um, it curves and it it the players have criticised it. Not to name names, but a lot of the players I've spoken to have criticised it. They don't think it's great. Lovell stuck up for it, but I don't think it's great. Um, you look at Aquinton's pitch. Someone with less money than us and our, our level, 
arguably below our level, but playing at our level at the minute, and they have a really nice pitch of playoff football, we get two goals. You know, should have had more. Um, yeah, I think at home we have forced guy direct a few, uh, a few, a lot more often than we'd like to, especially this, this midfield now. That's having to keep the ball. Um, we don't want to be going direct too often, especially if Tommy and Connor Wilson aren't playing. We've got Brandon Hallen and Josh Parker playing. Um, you want to play to their strengths. Um, so we'll see how it goes at Preschool Saturday. We want to get behind them. We're going to have a new walkout song, new kits and stuff. It's a fresh start off the back of three points against a team struggling. And you'd hope that we could do the job. Um, I think Lovell probably goes to the same 11 um, that played against Accrington. I think obviously you have to adapt a little bit to face your opposition. And I know he would have done his uh, research and stuff on how Burton play and how we can get a Burton. Arguably, you could do that within the system you play anyway. But I think he probably will stick with the same team. Um, obviously, like I said, the back five picks itself. And I think Bingham, Parrott, Regan, Charles, Cook and Burn, none of them weren't dropping. And then up top, Parker and Hanlon both scores. You can't drop either of them, can you? You know, both in good form. Um, let's hope they can notch another one, at least one of them. Um, Tom Hayes will be on the bench, I'm sure. I don't know about Connor Wilkinson. But likes of Elliot List to come back in. Um, if he's fit, he'll be on the bench. I have no doubts about that. Um... So in terms of the eleven, I think I go with the same eleven, and it's a tough one. Like I say, we've got good squad depth, especially in midfield and up front as well. Really, um, all quality players on their day up top, and I think we need to get a burst in if we get an early goal. Lovell spoke a lot about getting an early goal and how much it benefits us. Um, I think getting that early goal sets up well. Teams have to come out; it gives us more space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to predict three nil win. I think. I think but when the fans turn on you, it's just a matter of time until the management goes. Um, Burton are going to struggle this year, I think. I'm hoping it'll be six from six. So I'm going to predict 3 0 Gillingham. Goal scorers, I'm going to go Josh Parker, Dean Parrott. Hmm. Dean, Dean Parrott to get two. That's my prediction. Dean Parrott to get two and Josh Parker. Um, so I'll see how that goes on, in the vlog, obviously. Um, we'll be there this weekend. Be yeah, a Burton aren't a great side, and I think we should. Should be able to um, to get the better of them. But we'll see how it goes. Also, before uh, before the next podcast, we do have another game at Millwall in the Cup, the Den. Um, our old friends Millwall, that's the way, in the first round of the Carabao Cup, the League Cup. Uh, I wasn't planning on going, but um, when I was on the coach, actually, a little story. When I was on the coach for Accrington, Peter Lloyd, the guy that runs a coach service and obviously does commentary and stuff, um, he mentioned on the radio, he said, well, on the Tannoy thing, he said, if you're planning on going to Mill, do let me know. If you haven't bought a ticket already, um, I'll enter you into a draw. I've been given 10 tickets and 10 winners will be announced and given the tickets for Millwall for free. The adult tickets are priced at £10 each. Uh, we wasn't originally planning on going, but we, me and my dad said, why not? I might just say we're going. A lot of people already bought their tickets. 18 people entered for 10 tickets. So... You know, you normally have a one in two chance of winning and then both of us entered. So, you know, it was almost guaranteed that hopefully, well, it'd be a real shame if both of us missed out. But both of us got them in the end. Um, both me and my dad uh, got a free ticket for the Millwall game, £10 each. That's £20 saved, which is lovely. Booked it on the coach and we were off to the den on Tuesday. Um, last year, you might remember from the channel again, uh, we went to Reading on the first round in the Majeski Stadium, um, a championship side that lost out in the playoff final the year before. And we did quite well, actually. It was under Adrian Pennant. We had the better of the first half, I think. The second half, we died out and we lost 2-0. Um, but we did a job. Mill were going to be a different test. I think Reading really struggled last season. Uh, obviously, Yapstan went out. Paul Clement came in. Um, yeah, last year, Mill finished eighth in their first year back in the Championship. Everyone, well, I had them to go down. They finished eighth and just missed out on the playoffs, actually. Neil Harris has done such a good job there after getting them up. Um, he hasn't playing well. At the weekend, they bottled a 2-0 lead. Um, in the last few minutes, I think middles were scored in the 87th and 97th minutes, which is, I can't imagine that was ideal for Millwall. Um, getting off to a nice start, a 2-0 win against a good Middlesbrough side would have been great for them. But we, uh, Middlesbrough came back. I think as the championship sides do in the cup against low league opposition, they, Millwall will rotate. They're a different side from when we beat them 3-0 at the Den last time. Um but it will be my first visit to the Den. I had to do it at some point. Might as well do it in the cup when there's less tension. Um, yeah, they probably will rotate the likes of Gregory Morrison. There's been they've had bids rejected for the likes of Wallace, etc. Um, 
so that will all be cleared up by the time the game comes around. People have cleared their heads whether they're there or not. They didn't want to be there or not. Um, it's a little bit of a derby. Maybe Millwall will put out a strong side. Neil Harris obviously used to play for us. He's in charge there. Um, it'll be tough. It'll be really tough. We're going to go over there with no fear. One is causing upset, as we often do. Um, in terms of our side, I don't know what we'll go with. I think, I think at these sort of games, it's important. Maybe important to give others minutes, but it's, they've got to be up to the standard of the people they're putting in. Not too much of a downfall. So, for example, you can't really be dropping... Um, uh, let me think of an example. You can't be dropping... Um, Gabby Zakwani for Ryan Huckle. Uh, with all due respect to Ryan, obviously, he's just come through as a pro. Um, I think I'd probably change goalkeeper. Tom Haddon deserves a game. It's hard because Barry Fuller could obviously do a real job at right back, but... Luke O'Neill's crossing is such an asset to us. So it's hard to see which one you got about them until I think Max Aim will definitely play centre back. Maybe Gabby will be given a rest, Gabby Zakawani. Um he didn't play in the Reading game last year. He was in the crowd actually. So maybe Max Aim will play with Alex Lacey if he's fit. If not, I can't really see Finn O'Mara coming in, so I think Zakawani will probably play. Um I think Garmson will probably stick his stick, keep his place at left back. In midfield, like I say, anyone's guess. I think Callum Riley will come in. He'll probably captain the side if he's fit. Mark Byrne will probably play as well. And then Dean Parrott will play because he's class. But then again, you, you've obviously got Ryan Regan, Charles Cook, who's a very important player in that midfield. And then up top, I think Tom Eves will probably start with Elliot List, I assume, because obviously I don't think either of them will start in the league. And both of them, you'd look before before the season, I think that's probably our first choice strike, strike partnership, Elliot List and Tom Eves. Um, but... I think Parker and Hallen will start the weekend, even if Eves and List are going to be fit. Uh, Eves scored in a pre-season, uh, pre-season midweek friendly against Oxford. Um, that happened on Tuesday, uh, where they lost three two after making a lot of changes, as most of the friendlies went. Um, Elliot List didn't feature, neither did Josh Reese or Callum Riley. So, obviously, they they let's come back. It'll be a good day, you know. Stadium tick off, and. Just, dodgy as it can be it's got to be done so why not do it in the cup but there are different sides when we last played them we played them in pre-season a few years ago and we lost 3-1 I believe back and Femme scored for us and then they came down and then we beat them 3-0 at the den we lost against them on the final day when it all kicked off at Priestfield so it's our first meeting since um prediction 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 I think it does sort of depend how Saturday and the weekend goes for both clubs if Gillingham go and win and Mill will go and lose, then it could go in our favour. But obviously, Mill will going to have a lot of the ball. Um, Gillingham are going to have to work hard and keep the ball well when we do get it and play to our strengths, um, which is the midfield really and keeping the ball and get getting the likes of Elliot List, Regan, Charles Cook, Brandon Hallen, the pace on the ball. Um, I think I'm going to go two one Millwall. So it'd be nice to go there and score. Um, but it will be a very, very tough test. But I think it depends on this weekend goes as well. And at the end of the day, with all due respect to clubs at our level, we're not going to go and win the Carabao Cup. It would be nice to go and have a cup run, but the main focus is on the league. And if we get six from six, I'll be more than happy. So I have covered everything I wanted to cover in this podcast. Thank you very much for listening to the first episode. I understand it is just me and it is a lot of me rambling, but I love Gillingham. It is well my, my one true passion in life. So if you love Gillingham too, hopefully... You enjoyed listening to me today and uh, feel free to comment, get involved in a chat, obviously we're on Facebook, join our Facebook group, White Lines Media, um, join our Twitter page at White Lines Media or our Instagram, White Lines Media. Um, or you can find me on any of the platforms, um, Twitter at LRC Browning or Instagram LRC Browning as well. On YouTube as well, I've got my own channel, Living With Lewis, and we've also got the White Lines F1, White Lines Cricket and White Lines Wrestling channels um, on here. They're all in the description. You can check out our channel partners, Reese Parsons, Cobblers Vlogs, uh, ben Nappy in the Football League podcast as well. So I just want to give a shout out to Nathan. He's going for a really hard time at the minute. Love you, Nathan. Um, stick with it, buddy. Um, we're all we're all really proud of you. Um, so yeah, follow all of them on YouTube and Twitter and stuff. And we'll see you. Well, obviously we've got other videos going up, but we will see you for um, Burton against Gillingham at Priestfield on Saturday. Good to be in the new kit. Going to go up and buy that Saturday morning, I think, so that'd be good. But thank you very much for listening. Um, and we'll be back with the Gillingham podcast next week, next Thursday. Uh, up the Jills. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.